When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Psalm 126 begins with this declaration of God's faithfulness who had done great things for his people. He had restored their fortunes, resulting in laughter and shouts of joy. It was like a dream. Even while we are in lockdown, even when the infection rate is as high as it is, we can say with assurance now, today, that God has been faithful and he will continue to be faithful. He will continue to do good to us. But the end of the psalm shows that there was still more that they desired from God. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. The Lord restored their fortunes, but they still prayed for him to restore their fortunes. And we find ourselves in this same in-between place where we recognize his faithfulness, and yet we need him to restore us like those dry riverbeds in the Negev that only flowed with water during the wintertime and were dry otherwise. So it is in this in-between place. Was it just wasted time until fi God finally brought his deliverance? Absolutely not. In God's economy, all our exhaustion, all our frustration, all our loneliness, all our tears are seeds that can be brought to him. His redemption, it often happens underground. It often takes time for it to happen. But he will give life to the tears that we bring to him. He can turn seeds of tears into a harvest of joy. So Lord, we thank you that we are yours. We thank you that you can redeem anything that we give to you. And Lord, we gather up all our exhaustion and our frustration and our loneliness and our tears, and we bring all of it to you because only you can turn this into something that brings life and joy. Amen. Amen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jody Wicker, and this is my husband, Patrick, and we pastor Bogner Vineyard Church. Today, we're going to explore what it means to live a cultivated life with God, where he brings life and fruit out of the soil of our lives, and he redeems and transforms us. But first, Nick will lead us in worship this morning, so let's worship the Lord together.
and you're here grace of the Savior the heart of the Father you're all we need you're here the hands of the healer the power of your spirit you're all we need At the mention of your name Every chain will break I know everything will change Jesus Just the whisper of your name with silent wind and waves at the mention of your name and you're here you're the provider all I ever needed Jesus you Wonder-working power Everything you breathe on Is coming back to life At the mention of your name Every chain will break I know everything will change Jesus, just the whisper of your name will silence wind and waves at the mention of your name. You are my strength, you are my anchor, and you'll never fail. You are my hope, you will deliver Emmanuel You are my strength, you are my anchor And you'll never fail You are my hope, you will deliver Emmanuel Emmanuel At the mention of your name Every chain will break I know everything will change Jesus just the whisper of your name Will silence wind and waves At the mention of your name You're here The grace of the Savior The heart of the Father You're all we need You're here, the hands of the healer, the power of your spirit, you're all we need, you're all we need, you're all we need, you're all we need. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy. 
leading us in worship this morning. I just want to take a minute to thank all our critical workers at Bogner Vineyard Church for everything you're doing to support our community during this time. We are with you and we are praying with you and we want to hear your prayer request. So if you are in need of prayer, um, know that we are kicking off the prayer rota this week where we have one or two people from the prayer team available to pray with you during the week and certainly we're continuing the Sunday evening and Wednesday evening prayer. And always you're welcome to text your small group leader for prayer as well. Um, all that to say, we want to be with you during this time. We want to be praying for you and we want to know how we can be praying for you. So thank you to all of those critical workers who replied to my email and sent us prayer requests and gave us a picture of what you're going through. That was really helpful. And for those of you who haven't had time to check out the wine press, I encourage you to do so because we've listed all our critical workers there so you can pray for them by name and also their requests so you can partner with them in prayer this week. On Monday, we joined Vineyard QK in 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
You're welcome to fast one or more meals on one or more days through the 31st of January and use the prayer points linked in the wine press or on our Facebook page post. If you'd like to share any words you receive through the end of the month, please email church at bognervineyard.org.uk. Quiz night is this Tuesday, the 19th of January at 7.45 p.m. I hope you can join us for some midwinter fun and the Zoom for that meeting will be in the wine press. Vineyard National Gathering, 27th to the 29th of January. This event will be free to stream with uh, some leadership content during the day and worship and inspiring stories in the evenings. Anybody is welcome to watch the main sessions for free on YouTube. And if you don't get the wine press, you are welcome to get your phone out right now and take a photo of this screen. This is a friendly reminder that we haven't actually taken up a normal Sunday offering for over 10 months. And it is through your donations that Bogner Vineyard continues to serve both you and this community. So we invite you to give either a one-time or recurring donation using the bank details listed here. If you have any questions about giving, you are welcome to reach out to Paula. Patrick will now teach us about how God cultivates our lives. I spent some time uh, this past week learning a bit about farming here in the UK, including this series of videos on YouTube about a family's experience farming every month in the year. Now, all of this reinforced three things to me. A, there are some very beautiful aspects to a life of farming. B, there is a lot that I could learn about God if I lived and worked on a farm. And C, I really, really don't want to do this. God bless you, Yopi and Daniel, but this absolutely is not for me. I don't mind hard work. I do, uh, in fact, love being outside, but transporting cow muck to a field in the freezing cold or shearing sheep in a barn in the hot summer while, while covered in flies... Not for me, no thank you. So I've learned just because I enjoy the idea of gardening doesn't mean that I actually enjoy gardening. So also for this past year, Jody and I have received a box of fruit and vegetables delivered every week from an organic farm near Chichester. Uh, this is the one that came just this past Thursday. And it also forces me to cook Things like Swedes and leeks and Romanesco broccoli that I haven't really messed with much before. Now, when I look in the box, I usually see produce that is currently in season, like parsnips, which Jody and I have learned to love. They are much, much tougher to find in Texas. But there are some things that are usually included year-round, even if they are out of season. And this reminds me how disconnected I am from the seasonal cycles of sowing and of reaping, which were normal for every human generation everywhere for thousands of years until maybe about 75 years ago. Now, you and I may know that produce comes from the ground, but we generally experience it coming from a supermarket. Now, hear me, I'm not complaining that I can easily get apples in April and oranges in June if I want them. And I'm definitely not complaining that I can get avocados here in the UK, even though they have to be shipped here because they don't grow well outside and in the UK climate. But this consumer mentality of getting whatever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want, there are consequences to this especially in the ways that Christians understand following Jesus. God desires for us to bear fruit, but it's so important reminded of the way that fruit happens. The fruit we desire in our lives of love and of joy and of peace, it doesn't happen by flipping a switch do not ever, ever read an article titled Five Ways to See the Fruit of the Spirit in Your Life Today. Fruit comes when it's cultivated over time. And the fruit of the Spirit comes when we are cultivated by Him over time. And this is what we're talking about today. Our lives being cultivated by God. The trouble is, we don't begin 
our lives in Christ with hearts of rich soil. In the 2018 film, The Biggest Little Farm, John and Molly Chester arrived at Apricot Lane Farms, northwest of Los Angeles, California, and they discovered that the ground was dead. It was so hard that a shovel couldn't penetrate it, and rainwater would just drain right off of it. The ground was also infested with something literally called devil weed and puncture weed. It was kind of like a place where the curses from Genesis 3 had been realized. After Adam and Eve sinned, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. So they spent years clearing out the land and getting a whole bunch of animals to live on it. Cows and sheep and pigs and ducks and chickens and more. And after a lot of time and sweat and a whole bunch of animal poo, you started to see more and more life, but you didn't see the fruit yet that you were wanting to see. Some of that is because you can't plant a fruit tree and expect to have edible fruit in the first season. Also, all the new life brought lots and lots of pests. Snails ate the leaves of the fruit trees, and gophers ate the roots of the trees, and birds ate the fruit of the trees. And it was years later, after this ecosystem had become more diverse, that they could finally eat the fruit. Now, this was not so different from what was going on in the churches in Galatia. Many had recently come to know Christ, which brought an amazing amount of life to those who were in the church. But like those pests uh, with those uh, thriving fruit trees, all this new life brought a whole bunch of conflict too. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. False teaching had infiltrated the churches in Galatia, resulting in conflict. And instead of loving one another, they were living by the flesh, biting and devouring one another, it says. John Piper defines Paul's use of the word flesh as human action or achievement without dependence on the Holy Spirit and without glorifying Exalting in, trusting, treasuring, and valuing Jesus Christ. Very rich definition. If we live by the flesh, that means we don't depend on the Holy Spirit. And if Christ is not the center of our lives, our hearts become more and more like hard ground that can only produce thorns and thistles. Do we long for the joy of the Holy Spirit? like a desert longs for rain. And we may experience short-term joy when the rain comes, kind of like flowers that grow up quickly in a desert after the rain. But these flowers also die quickly for lack of good soil and water and cultivation. And we can't continue living by the flesh as we have been and you know, simply try to add a little bit of the Holy Spirit to it. This would in some ways be like adding more fertilizer to the desert floor so the flower might live a few days longer. It's just not a very good long-term solution. Instead, as Paul says, spirit life is completely different and in direct conflict with living by the flesh. So let's see what Paul says about the expected outcomes for both. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, 
factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, notice that Paul calls them the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Thorns are not fruit, but love and joy and peace and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit come from a life cultivated by God, where the flesh and its passions and desires are crucified with Christ. So I ask, what is the best life that you can hope for? And I don't even necessarily mean Christian life. I mean any life of joy that you can imagine. Have you chased what you think will bring you happiness only to find that it doesn't satisfy in the way that you thought it would? Have you tried to live authentically, but you've discovered that who you really are is kind of messed up? Do you feel like your happiness is thwarted by COVID or other factors outside of your control? Or maybe you're so overwhelmed and busy that you're only concerned about surviving one day at a time. Or perhaps you no longer even hope for joy. You simply long for less pain and less disappointment. So the good news in all of this is Jesus is your expert gardener. You are created by him, so he knows how to bring life to you in the midst of COVID, in the midst of your mess, in the midst of your busyness, and in the midst of your pain. If he can cultivate tears and turn them into a harvest of joy, like we heard earlier in Psalm 126, he can bring beauty out of whatever you bring to him. And Jesus was adamant that we learn how he brings life to us by observing the nature of seeds. Now, some of you may remember two of my earliest teachings uh, right after Jody and I arrived here in the UK. Uh, from Mark 4, Jesus started using a bunch of parables to describe the kingdom of God. And three of his first similes, remember similes like as, were the kingdom of God is like a seed. The kingdom of God is like a seed. The kingdom of God is like a seed. Which reminds us, perhaps, that we must understand how the kingdom of God is like a seed. We are like soil that must receive the word of God like a seed, so it will bear fruit. If we're not careful, as we see again in Mark 4, it will be stolen, it will be dried up, it will be choked out, this seed, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And yet, the soil of our hearts, even if it's really, really rich, it doesn't make things grow. Only God can make things grow. We plant, we water, we weed, but we are utterly dependent on him to bring growth. And God can bring tremendous growth from even the smallest of beginnings, just like the mustard seed. So, God wants to cultivate us. And how do we respond to that? First, expect fruit. The Chesters in our story did not start their farm in California because they thought it was just simply the right thing to do. They didn't want to start doing this simply just to experiment with soil. They wanted to enjoy the fruit of their work, which tells us we need to keep asking God to do amazing things in us and then let him bring his growth in his time. There's no need for us to take our spiritual temperature every now and then, you know, to see how loving or joyful or peaceful that we feel. It is his seed, his growth, his fruit, his timing. We trust in him to bring it in his way. Second, 
tend to your soil. When I asked about the best way to get rid of thorns and weeds in my garden in Austin, the gardener that I spoke to uh, told me to nourish my soil and my grass, which would inevitably choke out the life of so much of the thorns and the weeds in my garden. In the same way, the fruit of the Spirit is in direct opposition to the acts of the flesh. And when we make the soil of our lives receptive to the work of the Spirit and to the seed of His Word, the increase in life and the increase in health, it chokes out the presence of sin in our lives. So I ask again, what are we feeding? Uh, the soil of our hearts so the Holy Spirit can do his cultivation work in us. Can we set aside some time to either start reading or listening to the Bible, including possibly the Bible in one year again? If we have a choice about what music we can listen to during the day, uh, can we listen to worship music? And if we can't listen to music with words, perhaps we can simply listen to instrumental worship music. Do we need to pray about Netflix shows that we're watching or the games that we're playing that are polluting our hearts? Or are we carrying unforgiveness or unconfessed sin? Clearing out the thorns and rubble makes it so much easier for God's life to grow in us. Third, understanding sowing and reaping, the whole process of sowing and reaping, is very, very important. In John chapter 4, Jesus said, Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So those who followed God for centuries before Jesus' ministry began did so much hard work of prayer, of teaching about God uh, to others, and of following him. Jesus was saying that the harvest is now, but the disciples were reaping the benefits of the labor of all those who had gone before them, just as Jody and I reap the benefits of the hard work that Jan and Lisa and so many others did uh, who have invested their lives in you for so many years. I love it when we pray for people to get healed or experience breakthrough and God answers immediately. I love it. But sometimes we need to wait and see what God is growing. The sower is not more important or less important than the reaper. The work and the outcome is not more important and less important. The sower and the reaper are glad together. This happens in our own prayer meetings where we hear stories of answered prayer, God bringing reaping to so much of we have sown, and in the same prayer meetings, continuing to sow new prayers, all of this sowing and reaping, uh, both the sower and reaper being glad together. We love it when that happens. Now, when we engage and when we read scripture, God is still at work in our lives, even if we don't feel anything. Like a growing seed, God transforms our lives over time like a seed while we're not watching. When we worship out loud on the Sunday live stream, God is still at work even if we're alone. Worship transforms our lives even if it's not the same experience as worshiping together in person. When we share Jesus with someone, sometimes we're sowing and sometimes we're reaping. And if they don't commit, themselves to Christ immediately, it's not a failure if God simply wanted us there to sow. We are in the cultivation business, seeing God tra transform people over time by his spirit, his power, his way, his growth. We are not, again, in the supermarket business, 
where we get whatever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want it. Fourth, expect winter. In an article on grist.org, Matthew Kronsberg wrote why farmers want cold winters. For perennial crops, shorter days and sustained low temperatures bring a cycle of dormancy, a deep, almost anesthetized sleep during which growth is temporarily halted. Measured in chilling hours, this is the time when plants' energy is held in reserve, building up for new growth, and farmers can prune and transplant without fear of sprouting. Without sufficient chilling time, a fruit tree will generate fewer, weaker buds, limiting fruit production from day one. Growers monitor chilling hours in a season with a wary eye. If we are walking in obedience and still feel like our spiritual lives are cold and lifeless, this doesn't mean that God isn't doing anything. It could mean that he's building us up for new growth and taking us out of winter time too early would limit our future fruitfulness. Kronzberg also said that the deep, killing, sub-freezing cold of winter typically eliminates many damaging insects and pathogens. So perhaps God wants to deliver you from the harmful insects and pathogens of false expectations that you're in control of your life. Or possibly he wants to deliver you from your own pride about how productive and effective you can be during the lockdown. And some of this may have lingered in lockdown one and lockdown two, but now the winter of lockdown three is finally killing it off as God meant it to. One thing that I also learned is that this is the time of year that farmers spread slurry on their fields, which is a mixture of manure and water and is used as a natural fertilizer for grass and crops. Now, some of you may describe our current circumstances of lockdown three plus the cold, dark winter in excrement terms, bull excrement, horse excrement, or just plain run-of-the-mill excrement. And it may help you to think of our circumstances like fertilizer for new life to come later this year. So, instead of resisting winter, may we together wish each other bon hiver, good winter. So, in closing, let's ask God to bring his fruit into our lives, and let's tend to the soil of our hearts by the nourishment we add to it and the pollution that we keep from it. Let's res respond to God in whatever way he is cultivating life, either sowing or reaping, and let's be present to the good he is doing in us during this cold, dark winter.